In 2020, one of the most memorable drawings I did on this channel was Godzilla Venomized. Then in 2021, one of the most memorable drawings I did that year was Shin Godzilla turned into a dragon. And today I think we'll continue the trend, having my Xenomorph Godzilla be one of the most memorable drawings from this year on the channel. But of course it's not the only monster getting turned into an alien. A couple weeks ago a subscriber who goes by Nikolai Ackerman suggested that I take some famous monsters and turn them into Xenomorphs. I thought it was a really cool idea so I floated it out to my other subscribers subscribers and it got picked in a poll. Though there was a lot of passion for a Ninjago episode on here, so I am planning on doing that sometime soon too. But for now, Monster Xenomorphs. Let's go. Hit like if you want, subscribe if you feel like, but either way, enjoy the show. Despite the destruction he has caused and his occasional violent outbursts, most have come to accept the Titan Godzilla as a savior to our world. All the damage he has caused pales in comparison to that which would have come had he not existed to stop other, more violent titans from likely annihilating all human life on our planet. But now it seems we may need to find a new protector. Not one week ago, an alien ship was seen hovering above the Pacific Ocean. It was pulsing with a repeating sound that resembled Godzilla's mighty roar. After days of this, Godzilla arose from the depths beneath it and tried to leap out of the water and snatch it from the air in his jaws. The ship maneuvered out of the way but fired a small football-shaped object right into Godzilla's mouth. The vessel then cloaked itself and was gone. Godzilla was tracked by the organization Monarch to try and understand what had been fired into the creature's stomach, and while we still don't fully understand the events that transpired, we know the result may prove cataclysmic to our planet. Three days after the alien encounter, Godzilla began showing signs of great distress. Hours later, something was seen shifting behind the flesh of the titan's stomach. Soon after, a monster burst forth from within Godzilla, tearing his belly apart to escape and leaving Godzilla in critical condition. Monarch is doing all they can to try and resuscitate the king of the monsters, but in the meantime, havoc is being wreaked by the beast that burst forth from him, now called Xenozilla. The alien parasite seems to have taken on traits of Godzilla. In a manner of days, it grew to his same size, though has a longer tail with a bladed end. The creature also has no eyes, though evidently very keen senses. The worst difference of all, however, is that Xenozilla clearly shares none of the protective traits that the King of the Monsters had for humanity. It has leveled five cities and shows no signs of slowing down. The great ape Kong was even brought forth from the hollow earth to try and stop the creature. He fought well, but Xenozilla was far faster than its predecessor. Even when Kong did manage to get a damaging bite into the beast, the ape recoiled in agony as Xenozilla's green blood appears to be acidic and melted right through Kong's jaw. It wasn't long after that that the fight ended, with Xenozilla's tail pierced right through Kong's chest. Hope seems to be dwindling for our planet, but strangely enough, it seems those who created this creature are also invested in seeing it destroyed. Five more alien ships akin to the one that shot forth the projectile into Godzilla have been following Xenozilla's movements and have even sent some of their own kind down to Earth with various weapons to try and fight this new titan. It's almost as if they created this monstrosity specifically for the purposes of hunting and killing it. While they do look like formidable beings carrying advanced weaponry and armor and bearing menacing looking mandibled mouths, it is difficult to believe that they alone could be capable of slaying a creature of the vast scale and power of Xenozilla. Though, with no word on Godzilla's condition as of yet, they may be our only hope. Now I heavily debated not opening the video with this drawing because it kinda quality wise just dwarfs the other two in this episode. I like how all three drawings turned out, but this one just feels next level. I absolutely love this one. I don't know what it is about Godzilla that when I do some kind of alternate monstery version of Godzilla, I just want to put my everything into it. I mean, I've always loved Godzilla since I was a kid, but just, I don't know, something about doing a Godzilla drawing just really brings out my best. One thing I was very aware of going into this is that I wouldn't be able to draw people's eyes to the creature's head the same way I normally would by 
doing something nice and interesting with the creature's eyes because xenomorphs don't have eyes and I wanted to keep that consistent through these drawings. So what I decided to do instead is have bursts of green flame or smoke coming out the side of this Godzilla's mouth to be some nice contrast to the blue and purple of the rest of the scene. And that worked out exactly as perfectly as I was hoping it would and in and around this creature's head as well. I really love the contrast between the domed head kind of part and the really wrinkled lips. The domed head is really smooth and the lips are really wrinkly and just have a lot of texture and those two things contrast really nicely with each other. Overall, I am just super happy with how this turned out. I definitely think it could be my best drawing of the year so far and if you all like it half as much as I do, then I think you'll really enjoy the finished result. Let's take a look. In Middle-earth, while dragons are known to have immense capabilities for destruction, there is one other kind of beast that rivals them in this regard. The Balrogs are flaming, smoking demons of incredible power. Once the primordial spirits known as Maiar, these demons were corrupted by the original Dark Lord Morgoth to do his bidding and have been menaces to the world since their creation. They can be slain by a creature of equal might or by a powerful enough Istar, such as in the great battle between Gandalf the Grey and the Balrog known as Durin's Bane. But never before has Middle-earth seen a Balrog as mighty as the one that recently awakened. Like Durin's Bane had been for many years, this beast slumbered in the depths of a mountain cave. The dwarves who mined these caves knew of its existence and kept their digging far from its place of slumber. But one day, they heard its cry coming from the cavern depths, though it sounded not like a battle cry, but shrieks of agony. While they debated fleeing the mines or attempting to take up arms against it, a creature came forth from its hiding. Few had ever seen a Balrog and lived to tell of the experience, so when they saw this monster, the dwarves simply believed it to be like any other of its kind. But against all odds, this creature was even more powerful than most Balrogs. Having reforged friendships with mankind since the fall of Mordor, the dwarves called on these allies to help them defeat the beast. But even with further forces and weaponry, they were not able to stop it. The creature showed an alarming ability to utilize stealth as an advantage. It would douse its flames and cling to the ceiling of the caverns, waiting for warriors to come seeking it. It would then slice through whole troops with one blow of its tail or reignite its body in flames and call forth infernal weapons to dispatch larger groups. The power of this Balrog is so immense that a brave party of warriors felt the need to risk their lives to venture down to the place from which it had awakened to see if there were any clues as to how it had gotten so powerful or possibly how to stop it. What they found immediately confused and alarmed them all. There, in the depths, was a dead Balrog. They considered that this Balrog had been slain by the one now scourging the caves above, but there was no sign of a great battle. The only other thing they found in those caves below were the deteriorating remains of a large egg and the charred body of a spider-like insect. Sadly, this provided no aid in besting the beast, and to this day it stalks through the caves, waiting for any brave or foolish souls to come through to meet their swift demise. I've been considering working with a Balrog on this channel for a while. In fact, I almost did a Balrog as a Transformer. I was thinking of doing famous monsters as Transformers in a Beast Wars kind of episode. Still might do that, but when I was given the idea for the Xenomorph episode, I was like, ooh, a Balrog Xenomorph could be super cool. Admittedly, I probably could have worked more Xenomorph elements into this one. It ends up kind of just looking like a Balrog, but with a Xenomorph head and tail, but I still think it ends up looking pretty cool. To contrast the Godzilla drawing, I decided to give this one kind of a smokier, messier kind of background. I felt that would work well for a Balrog. Looking at all the images of Balrogs, it's always kind of swirled in smoke and flames, and I probably could have emphasized that even more, but I also wanted some clean line work and you know, my usual kind of shading and lighting. So while the Xenozilla drawing ended up looking as crisp as fresh morning dew, this one definitely has some more messiness to it that 
you know, isn't really my usual kind of aesthetic, but I think works well enough. But again, it's hard to compete with how much I like that first drawing in this episode. I do make a few changes after the drawing is finished, just add a few little extra details and change some of the coloring a bit to have it stand out from the background more. And I had drawn this originally planning for it to be Durin's Bane from Lord of the Rings, and I was going to write the lore as if this was a Durin's Bane xenomorph coming to fight Gandalf set in the first Lord of the Rings movie slash book, but I kind of changed that up last minute. And I hope you all enjoyed both the lore and the finished result of the drawing. Let's take a look. As usual, all of the art from this episode will be up as posters on my Teespring store by the time you're watching this, but fair warning, I am having to up the price of all my physical products on the Teespring store because Teespring upped its base price, so if I didn't increase my price, I would be making almost no money off the stuff being sold on there. Digital products like my ink bundles won't be going up, just the posters and shirts and stickers and stuff, though it will actually take me a while to go through everything and one by one up the price. So if you want one of my older posters before the price increases, you might want to go to my store now. Anyway. Let's get into the last drawing, shall we? Let's go. The town of Hawkins, Indiana has faced many menacing beasts from the upside down. A dark reflection of their own town where lurks a cruel explorer of this realm, Vecna, who desires to wipe humanity off our world and reshape it as he sees fit. He's used all manner of creatures from his dark crimson realm to try and achieve this, but his latest discovery proved to be as hostile towards him as it was to those in Hawkins. Centuries ago, unbeknownst to any parties involved in the conflict between Vecna and Hawkins, a ship crashed in the forest, near where the town would someday blossom. Its pilots were deceased and the vessel was eventually grown over by the woods, never to be discovered. In our realm, that is. The Upside Down, being a dark reflection of our world, also had a reflection of this ship buried within it, that Vecna eventually discovered. He found inside it a whole array of large eggs. When treaded too close to one, it began to open. A creature from within attempted to leap onto his face, but he was fast enough to catch it, saving himself from an attack. For some time, he studied these eggs and eventually lured one of the scourges of the Upside Down, a Demogorgon, into the ship to peer into one of them. The creature inside leapt out and wrapped itself around the Demogorgon's flowering toothed maw. The Demogorgon quickly tore the leaping creature to shreds, but it was still able to inject something into its stomach. Not long after, the Demogorgon began to act strangely, sickly. Eventually, from its stomach burst forth what appeared to be a smaller Demogorgon with a bladed tail. Vecna watched as the creature grew and assumed he had a new monster to fight for his cause, but it soon struck out at him. It was stronger and faster than a Demogorgon and had an extra mouth within its own that could thrust out at rapid speeds to snatch and draw its prey into its larger mouth. But even with its added might, it was no challenge for his telekinetics. While he couldn't control the creature, he was at least able to lead it to a gateway back to Hawkins. If he couldn't command it, in the least he'd set it loose on the people who stood between him and his conquest. He'd eagerly watch from the other side to see how young Eleven could handle this new threat. Now originally I'd planned on having the third drawing be a werewolf, and I do think it would be really cool and fun to do a xenomorph werewolf at some point, but when I was going through some lists of famous movie monsters and monsters in general, I saw the Demogorgon come up from Stranger Things and I was just like, oh, yep, I gotta do this. It was, I love, I really loved season four of Stranger Things. I loved the Stranger Things D&D episode I did earlier this year, and I was just like, this is going to be a really fun creature to xenomorphize. One thing that made me a little bit hesitant is the fact that, you know, the Demogorgon, I really like the design, but there's not a ton to it. It's kind of just a tall white dude with a freaky mouth thing. But I was like, you know what, that's enough to go off of. I know I trust myself to do a good job with this. And I knew it would be fun to set the drawing in the upside down because I could have some like viney trees and have the background be really red. I do change up the background after the drawing finishes because something about it just wasn't working for me. I felt like I needed to add a little bit of more hint of foggy clouds in the background. And I do think that ends up helping the piece shine a little bit more than what I have as this sped up version of the drawing finishes. This is also the only drawing in the episode where I have the extra mouth coming out of the Xenomorph mouth, and I think it fits well in this drawing. I 
considered adding it to the other drawings, but with the Balrog, it just felt weird because inside of its body is supposed to be like all flames. So I didn't know where that mouth would be coming from. And the Godzilla one was just already so detailed that I didn't want to add another thing to it. But in this one, I am glad I put it in there. It wouldn't have been right to have a whole Xenomorph episode without having any of the second mouth showing up. I did also consider for this episode having the lore be narrated by my own original character, Astra, who in the past has taken Venom symbiotes to a bunch of different dimensions in the multiverse, like in my Venomized Dragon episode from a couple years ago now. Figured she might have done the same thing with Xenomorph eggs at some point, but I wanted this episode to be approachable to people who are new to the channel. So didn't end up going that route this time. Anyway, it's no Xenozilla in my opinion, but I do really like how this drawing turned out. Let's take a look. That turned out to be a very cool concept for an episode. Thank you, Nikolai Ackerman. And I would love to know if people want to see more of this. I could even do like Pokemon Xenomorphs or famous cartoon characters or, you know, just more monsters. Give me some ideas in the comments if you got them. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note. And the thought I want to leave people with today is something that I have really learned over the last year and a half which is that happiness is a skill that anyone can improve at. I've always liked the idea that happiness is a choice, and I do believe that to a degree, but I've realized that it's not in the sense that you can just decide, oh, I'm gonna be happy for the rest of the day, week, month, whatever, and your mind is just going to abide. Because a lot of us over our lives have been programmed with a lot of negative thinking and mentalities that have just become our default. So if you want to get better at being happy, you have to study it and practice it like you would any other skill or thing you you wanted to learn more about. Read or listen to books on happiness, psychology, spirituality, anything that you think might be able to help, and then put those ideas that you're learning into practice. You're not going to change your programming immediately, but over a period of time, practicing being happy more and more, you will find you get a lot better at it naturally, and it just becomes more of your base instinct. I hope that's inspiring to someone out there. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next episode on Monday. Goodbye.